Welcome to uh, today's webinar and we're very proud to have a important guest with us uh, today, uh, Ken Levy. Ken, are you there? Yeah, and even though you've known me for many years, I pronounce it Levy, but I'm so used to both ways, it doesn't matter. I, I know, and I keep doing this, don't I? And you keep correcting no, me. No, you do. And we also have on the line uh, Sean Devlin. He is one of the senior engineers at uh, Servoice. We have a couple of things to, uh, to talk about uh, today. First, we will kick off with uh, a quick introduction by Ken and, and what he thinks of um, the future of software development and, and Servoy. Then I will have a very brief overview of the architecture of Servoy so that you have a bit of a background if you're new to Servoy and discuss a couple of uh, case studies quickly on other FoxPro uh, developers and companies and how they're using Servoy. And then Sean will build a, a real-life HTML5 application in about 30 minutes. And when necessary, during these slides or demo, Ken will interject with, with his comments on how this all maps to the, uh, the FoxPro world. So having said that, uh, let's um, kick off with an introduction by Ken. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, some Fox developers uh, may know me from going way back. I started with... You know the Fox Base, Fox Pro in the 80s, and then I I did this tool, Gen Screen X, in 1992 at JPL, and a lot of people it had over 100,000 downloads on CompuServe. You know before you could download stuff off the internet, and uh, and then I started working with the Fox Pro team at uh, when Microsoft bought Fox Software at, um, for version 3.0, and and then they asked me uh, when I worked at Flash Creative Management with Alan Greiber and company that I. Uh, I designed and built the class browser that's in Foxpro, and other, and I ended up doing other tools as well. So I was kind of a consultant on the Foxpro team, adding things to 3.0. And then after that, when the 5.0 was being worked on, I actually moved from Los Angeles to Seattle and just worked on the Foxpro product, adding XBase things that are written in Foxpro that shipped in the box. Did that for many years. Um, and eventually, I I, uh, I did some dot com stuff outside of Microsoft, and then came back to Microsoft and was the product manager from what 2001, so I guess 2005, which was version seven, eight, and nine, last three versions. Um, and then uh, I worked on Windows Live, Visual Studio, and then I left Microsoft in 2008, and I've been an independent developer since 2008. One of the things that I've uh, I've done in that time is being independent is I've gone to companies around the world that uh, have Foxpro apps and they're analyzing you know what they're going to do next. I mean Foxpro works great for them but for either technical reasons or marketing reasons they needed to move beyond Foxpro whether they replace it completely or do something in addition to Foxpro. Um, and along that way I discovered the product Servoy and found that it was um, it architecture, and I don't know how else to put it other than it felt like some kind of evolution of how how if FoxPro evolved to cloud, web, mobile, and you know that that's how it would be done with FoxPro. If there was some kind of a rewrite version 10 of FoxPro, I look at Servoy and say, well, that's that's how I would want the FoxPro team to build it. To be honest, it's the way the architecture is set up, and we're, there's some slides that talk about the architecture, and I'll try to put, Jan will describe some of it, and I'll put it in a little bit of context to a Fox Pro developer. Um, one of the things that I've, uh, what I do when I talk to a company is just, uh, they, they might have some ideas about what, what platform and tools they want to move to. I usually take the approach of, well, I'm not going to tell them what, what I think they should do is more of uh, you know analyze what they have and give them all the options and let them make that decision based on you know them obtaining all the information that they should have to make that decision. Um, and in many cases that I've talked to companies where they have uh, decided to adopt Servoy um, with their Fox Pro experience, and as far as my knowledge, every company that's done that has had a very positive experience. Um, so it's it's useful for a Fox Pro developer to uh, analyze what Servoy offers to see uh, if it fits into the strategy and your roadmap. Um, so 
uh, to continue on this uh, slide here, as you can see, um, one of the reasons that you know Fox Pro developers sometimes maybe have a struggle with some platforms, let's just say Visual Studio and .NET, is it's not near as data driven and, and dynamic as Fox Pro. And so many developers have designed you know a Fox Pro app where it's it's data driven, dynamic, and there's certain things and it's object oriented in a certain way, you know, with with inheritance and visual like subclassing a form and so forth. And and the way the development environment works and even being able to you know interact with the development environment and you know you don't get that with Visual Studio the same way in .NET. And of course that more targets a Windows platform only unless you're doing something like ASP.NET and the web. And then if you go that direction, then you suddenly become a web developer. Um, and I found, you know, that either you're a kind of a rich client developer, or you're a web developer, and if you go down the path of building web apps where you hand code HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and everything, it's like a whole different planet you're on. And you have to kind of become a full-time developer just doing that to keep up with all the stuff. Um, so you're either kind of a web developer or you're not, unless you're just someone who can tweak things. But to be able to build a rich, you know, where you're controlling the source code of the web stuff, you know, that, that's that's a pretty big challenge. And of course, um, one of the things you'll see here with Servoy is that it has a rich visual development environment where it basically dynamically builds the HTML for you. Um, so you're building a you know a form and control based rich UI, but it's it's handling the, the web client for you dynamically. Um, so maybe we should go on to the next slide, and then I'll interject a bunch of other points and thoughts that I have as we go. And okay, sounds good. Yeah. All right. So if you take a step back on on today's reality, then I think there's a big shift going on in how software is being developed. We used to, and I also personally come from, from a long um, period of software development. I started about 30 years ago developing my first application. And back then, and then also until quite recently, the thought process was very much bottom-up. So we would, think of, we would start thinking about the non-functional requirements. So that's your, your architecture, that's your security, that's your scalability, your performance, all those non-functionals, which are very important but do not make a big difference in terms of functionality. Then there's some business logic, and then very often the user experience, especially from us developers, was often an, an, an afterthought that has to be stuck on the application when it is done. In today's reality, when you start really thinking about the user first, you begin with the user experience, and then you work yourself uh, the way down, and then being able to select a platform that takes care of the non-functional requirements for you has become very critical. So a platform that takes care of, for example, a UI component independence that you can use any UI library out there that makes your development process very efficient, that provides you with the infrastructure to do the QA, the testing of your application, the scaling once you move your application to a cloud-based architecture, but also supports uh, a lot of the standard things that you need to be able to deploy software like multilingual capabilities, multi-tenancy capabilities, being able to deploy it to any user on any device, being compliant in terms of um, laws and regulations, being consistent across the different platforms that are out there today, but also providing security and, and auditing inside your application. And that's really what Servoy as a platform does for you, so that you can focus on the functional requirements. We take care of all the non-functional requirements of the platform. So if we, if we take a quick overview of the architecture, then you will see that Servoy uses a, uh, a three-tier architecture. And actually, with an HTML5 client, you could even argue about a four-tier architecture because you can also have client-side business logic. So at the bottom layer, there is your data layer. A data layer can be uh, a database, uh, it can be a file, can be email, can be external data sources provided through web services or through an API. Then Servoy has a stateful application server, and this enables you to deliver complex 
business applications that can still run over the internet without needing remote video such as Citrix or remote desktop. So with a and either a native client that runs over the internet or a browser-based or a mobile uh, front-end. In the client layer, uh, where your business logic is, is executed, uh, but stored on the app server, you can then deploy this to the user interfaces uh, that are on the top layer here. Uh, and Servo allows you to take from a single code base the approach to all those different uh, user interfaces. And I think Ken, but maybe you can you can chime in on this. That, that yeah, there's probably... some interesting things in the. Uh, I, I want to try to paint a, a verbal picture, uh, a verbally paint a visual picture for you that kind of you understand. Obviously, with Fox Pro, you're installing Exe DLL and some support files and a Windows-based file system. And of course, Fox Pro, when you install it, does things with the Windows registry. And of course, even when you do the runtime. You just kind of a you have to register at least the DLL and it's in the registry and it's a com object and you get that idea. It, and with Servoy, it's Java based. When you install it, it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it doesn't do anything with the Windows registry if you if you develop on uh, the Windows platform. And it puts in a folder all your Java files that are. You can even have like multiple ver versions of Servoy side by side. Inside that, there is uh, Eclipse. So Servoy is built on um, the Eclipse IDE and then uh, customizes and adds additional functionality for Servoy development. So you get all the power of Eclipse and then more. And the other thing is, is that there's, an app, there's a folder called the Application, and it actually puts a, a Servoy engine in there. Now, you can think of this as, a, as like a, a, an application server one of the fascinating things is if you think how Fox Pro uses the SCX and the VCX system and how it stores your source code and memo fields in there, you know, Fox Pro in some areas uses uh, the, its own database engine for your application. Well, Servoy treats your application like data. And so what you have to realize is when you install the development version of Servoy, you're getting uh, the ID and the tools, but you're getting kind of a development version of the, the server itself. When you build an app, it's taking the app that you're building with the source code and the layout controls and all the, all that stuff, and it's it's editing a database. And then when you run it, the application server that's running locally will run the app, and it's auto-generating uh, the client. And that when you have a web page, your business logic is still hitting the server it's using AJAX and other technologies. So if you said view source on the browser, you wouldn't see your code. So it's all on the server and it's secure. And then what you can do is to install the Servoy application server only on uh, another machine. It could be Linux, Mac, Windows, whatever, and it could be anywhere that has HTTP access. You can put it on the Amazon EC2 cloud server or Azure or in any, you know, uh, a LAN machine anywhere, and over HTTP, then you access your application, okay? And then, it, then you can use it in any browser and so forth. Um, so that is important to realize that you know where the industry is going and it has been going for the last 10 years is towards mobile, web, you know, um, and uh, you know virtualization and cloud-based hosting. Now, not everything has to be cloud-based, but the ability to just deploy your application to any server or cloud without changing a single line of code in your app uh, is important. For our, you know, for you know, future and scalability and so forth. So, I'll add one more thing, and that is, one of the applications that I work on the last several years is called Light Pro, uh, Light Pro software, and it's actually uh, founded by Chick Bornheim, who created. Uh, he has Micro Mega as his other company, which has uh, the product Foxfire Reporting, uh, which you might be familiar with if you're a Fox Pro developer. Well, the Light Pro system is actually. Uh, for going out in the field and collecting data on a building lights and then you do an audit and you're collecting data and so forth. But on the server in a cloud, we have a Postgres SQL running and then there's also Servoy and then also the Foxfire reporting engine, which is Fox Pro runtime DLL. It's all hosted on Amazon cloud. And so there's direct access from the Fox Pro right to Postgres SQL and it, you know, Foxfire can be used with any uh, SQL database. So well, Foxfire actually makes a great reporting tool for um, 
for Servoy as well as the Jasper reports is out there too. But if you're familiar with the, the Foxfire reporting, it works great with, with Servoy. But also there's all kinds of integration capabilities. We don't have time to go into it in this webinar, um, but there's all kinds of ways you can integrate with COM and other interop between Fox Pro and Servoy. So it's not just a thing where you rewrite your application of Servoy, you could actually have it side by side in some cases or sharing data in some cases. So hopefully that helps. Um, I can't spend too much more time on it, but I just wanted to paint you that picture so that it gives you a better understanding because sometimes there's a paradigm shift and it can get a little fuzzy. Uh, and just um, Does that sound logical, Jan, the way I described yeah, that, it? Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful, yes, thanks. Okay. thanks. All right, so, um, so Surfway allows you also to reuse uh, what you already have in FoxPro, in .NET, in Java, and, and in other technologies and deliver that with a great user experience. And let's quickly zoom in before we dive into the demo on how that, is, how that can be done with Visual FoxPro. So uh, if you look at the combination of Servoy and FoxPro, then Servoy allows you to take applications to you know, any kind of device that you need to deploy, whether it's cloud or browser-based or mobile. We give you rapid application development capabilities for HTML5. So you don't have to write the HTML5 yourself, but we will do that for you. You can just visually design your forms, as Sean will show in the demo. We support the full lifecycle from design to develop to test, build, and deploy in a single platform. You can run on any backend, whether it's DPF or a SQL-based database that is that is all supported. We provide you with the with the with the NFRs, and you can also reuse what you already have built in Foxpro. And there's a couple of ways of, of doing that. Uh, technically, about four of them. A, you can connect directly to DBF files. So we have a built-in uh, native driver for DBF files that connects straight into those files. It's very high performance, uh, so it will, it will give you the same and in some cases even better performance than building uh, FoxPro applications. So that means that you can run that concurrently with your FoxPro applications. You can also connect to your FoxPro code. So if you have logic that you want to expose business rules, then if you can expose them through a DLL server, you can integrate them uh, using a library called Jacob. And then the third option is to, in FoxPro, expose your logic or data as a REST data service. And option number four, you know, some FoxPro developers are already using SQL Server. And obviously, both FoxPro and Servoy can connect to a SQL Server, so then you can share uh, the database. So there are different ways of doing it, and each has their benefits and downsides. So depending on, on what you're doing, you'll be using one of these uh, four, uh, four options. So feel free to, to reach out to us if, if you want to know which is the best option for your specific situation, because we realize that every situation is different. All right, a couple of examples, and then we'll dive straight into Sean's uh, demo. Uh, Jonar is a Canadian ERP vendor and uh, they've been very successful with their FoxPro-based ERP, and in the past years, they have rewritten that uh, ERP. So this is a large, complex, transactional application that, that's a full-blown uh, ERP from you know, financials to payroll to logistics to invoicing to customer management to inventory to product control. It's, it's all in there written with a small uh, development team. And this is where really Servoid, just like FoxPro excels with a small development team, you can write complex uh, business applications. And uh, because of Servoid's architecture, you can really get a great user experience and deploy it through the browser to your uh, end user. So your deployment is going to be very easy to uh, to achieve and whether you have can i add one thing about jonar yeah sure uh, the founder and uh, of the company it's i think they were had been at the time around for 25 years based in montreal uh, uh about three years ago maybe maybe th maybe four uh the founder attended southwest fox uh, um in phoenix the annual fox pro conference and at some point started talking to me about servoy 
and eventually I ended up being invited uh, to visit their company in Montreal for I think it was three or four days, maybe four days, and they were pretty much set on moving to .NET for your you know typical uh, path in thinking, but very worried about the being able to do the customization and dynamic stuff since they have all kinds of different customers uh, in the vertical market. And all I did was pretty much do demos and answer their questions and, and analyze what they had and, and kind of explain how you would do certain things in Foxpro and Servoy. And then after my visit, they spent some time with the people uh, at Servoy and then they ended up going with, with Servoy. And now, um, as far as I know, that that uh, um, they actually do presentations at the Servoy conferences, and they're kind of like, you know, pretty well known in the in the Servoy community as a as a, re a really great solution that mapped from Foxpro to Servoy. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the explanation. Um, another example, and I, th I think one of the developers actually attending. Um, so, so welcome, uh, Thomas, to uh, to today's presentation. And Thomas and his team at Deutsche Bahn are developing and replacing Foxpro applications with Servoy, both in the back office and also in the in the front office. And the front office used to be based on on Windows Mobile, but they switched that to Servoy because now, from a single platform, they can run both their back office applications and their front office applications on Servoy. So they use the native Servoy client because they need to run offline. They have hundreds of Android devices in the field that are running Servoy, and when they have a connection to the central database, they synchronize all data then collected and analyzed by a Servoy application and then piped into SAP. SAP is the main ERP system at, at Deutsche Bahn, and Servoy is used for a lot of uh, uh, enhancement applications that are difficult, if not impossible, to build in SAP and with Servoy, they can really build those uh, enhancement applications to their ERP uh, platform. Another great example of how Servoy is successfully used by Foxpro developers. Another example is Infogroon, a Dutch ERP vendor. They have a pretty big ERP system, very strong in uh, generating uh, invoices and, and orders uh, for, for complex uh, projects uh, entirely. They used to be entirely based on Foxpro and have now entirely rewritten into uh, the Servoy platform. Autoflex is another company that builds automotive uh, software. They come from Foxpro, have moved to Servoy, found that it was great to be able to easily deploy mobile applications in the field. As you guys probably know, car dealerships uh, increasingly need mobile apps so that on the road they can manage, they can manage the stock control if they're buying cars, they can instantly publish data about those cars on, on their websites. Really the integration of websites, back office and front office was for them a great move that they could uh, could make. Sunetti, another company that has built an ERP system. So again, a complex, large business application coming out of Foxpro and built and deployed on uh, the Servoy uh, platform. What all these customers tell us when, when we talk to them is that thanks to Modernizing with Servoy, they've been able to increase their market share to extend the life cycle of, the, of their products and also increase the, the revenue and profits that they are making as a, as a software company. So in Servoy, and, and Sean is now going to talk about this in his demo, you can use any type of UI components. As you guys have seen in the demos, there are quite a few different UIs that have come by. And that's because in Servoy, the UI side is entirely open. We ship with a default set of components, but you really can use any type of HTML component that is out there, whether it's Twitter Bootstrap based or Google Material Design or, or really any type of, of look and feel, Kendo UI, etc., can all be used in, uh, in Servoy as a web component and easily be hooked up. Last but not least, before we dive into the demo, there's a very active and large community. This is another similarity with the Foxpro world that we have conferences where developers get together, where they share uh, information, where they drink a beer uh, at night to, uh, to have some, some fun as well, besides learning a lot of things uh, during uh, the day. So both online and in the real world, there are very active communities.
So now let's switch over to Xi'an to build an HTML5 app uh, in, in about, th actually I think uh, Xi'an you have exactly 30 minutes left. So let's see what you can do in this, uh, in this time. So before Sean starts, can I make one little quick point that's for a Fox developer, and that is a Fox developer would care, okay, how, what kind of programming am I going to do if I'm in Servoy? What language is it? How do I program? And to summarize it at a high level, uh, even though Servoy is, is built and based in Java, everything's exposed as an object, and you primarily program in JavaScript. So if you just imagine a really easy but powerful programming language, JavaScript, and everything you would do in Fox with functions and the X-based language, uh, you would do just through object libraries. Um, and you'll probably see that as Sean does demos, but I just want to make sure people are clear, like, you know, what kind of programming environment they would experience since um, coming from Fox Pro, that would be a common question. Excellent. Thank Go you. ahead, Sean. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, I guess what, what I'm going to try to do in the next few minutes is um, take what Jan and Ken have been talking about and, and try to make it more concrete, at least from the uh, point of view of the developer experience and also the user experience. Uh, so my goal is to show you something that is sort of small enough uh, in scope that you, um, you, know, you get a feel for uh, what it's like to deliver an application um, using Servoy. Uh, but also that's uh, compelling enough so that it's not just something which is, um, you know, one screen or, you know, something so simple that it doesn't really uh, serve as a correlation to a piece of a business application. Uh, so I thought um, a nice approach might be to first show you a small application that I've built, um, describe it a little bit, how it works, and then we'll jump into uh, trying to basically rebuild that in um, the time that we have left. Can you guys hear me okay and see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what I have here is made a, a small little web application, uh, CRM type thing. It, it um, is using a few database tables that are joined together. Um, it's uh, sort of like a sales order system. Uh, you can see I have on the left-hand side uh, a list view, and on the right-hand side I have a detail view of the order, as well as in the sort of lower right quadrant I have um, the uh, line items that are on the order. Um, I have some uh, basic CRUD capability searching, so uh, let's say I want to find uh, orders which contain um, coffee in them, for example, and you can see that over here I have coffee in the line item, and as I scroll through um, my orders, you can see that each one does contain coffee. Um, I could narrow my search down. Uh, this is sort of like a text-based searching, almost like an internet search. Let's say I want uh, orders containing coffee and also Germany, and you can see that um, uh, these are all uh, have been shipped to Germany, but also uh, contain coffee. Uh, so in that regard, I'm able to search across multiple tables just with a simple intuitive um, kind of internet-like search. You'll also notice that as I'm, as I'm paging through the records here, uh, you can see I have some visual components over here, a pie chart, and a Google Map component that are updating as I as I page through uh, each order. So uh, those are actually data-bound components. Jan was mentioning that you can also incorporate uh, third-party layout managers, third-party um, uh, front-end libraries uh, and components. Uh, the chart is from uh, Telerik Kendo uh, UI, and um, you can see that it's showing sort of the proportional um, distribution of each item in the order. Uh, so here, this, this one has quite a few items. Um, and you can see that if I were to um, change even the number of units, it's data bound. So uh, as I tab out, I'll, I'll save this. You can see that the chart was updated and that now the Chai product op uh, occupies a much larger slice of the order. Uh, this is a fully functional Google map. Uh, I'm going to mouse wheel over it. You can see that I can zoom in and out. I could, for example, turn on terrain, use the buttons, even use street view if I wanted to. Uh, and again, that's fully data bound. If I change my selected record or if I actually change the underlying data, as we might see in the demo, uh, then uh, that component is also respawning. I didn't have to really do much uh, to use this component, as we'll see in the demo. Um, uh, I guess finally I just point out that 
um, that all of the controls here are data bound. Uh, you notice that as I was changing the quantity uh, on my uh, on my order items list, as I tab off, you can see that right away the the order total was um, was updated, and uh, I can save that, and you can see that the the pie chart was updated. That's all happening because Servoy is uh, really has, has a strong middle tier. Uh, and uh, has uh, full-fledged data binding, so it makes the developer's job really easy so that the user gets that dynamic um, user interface. So um, we have about 25 minutes or so. Um, I'd like to try to build this. Um, it may sound a bit uh, of a tall order, but I think it's possible, or at least I think we can get pretty close to uh, some of the functionality. Uh, so let's step into the uh, Servoy IDE. Um, what I'm going to do is create a, a new solution. That's that sort of Servoy speak. We call uh, application a solution. I'm going to give it a name. We'll call it demo VFP. Um, there's a few uh, modules here that I'm going to include, and um, I'm going to set a few uh, a few property settings. Uh, for example, I'm going to set um, a style sheet that I've included that helps me with some of the CSS, um, and I'm going to start to build some forms. So the the first form uh, that I want to build um, is we'll we'll build the the grid view for looking at orders. Um, so I have some pre-configured connections to data sources here. Uh, so I have this example data uh, database. It's the classic Northwinds database. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but it's kind of a sample database that's been on the Internet for a few decades. Uh, I'll grab the orders table. Uh, maybe I'll name this form orders grid. And I'm going to uh, extend using form inheritance from a base form called grid base. Uh, next, what I'll do is uh, place a few fields on the form. Um, I'm going to scroll down. You can see that because uh, Servoy is all about data mining, it already can see inside the database table. Uh, I also have some relations that help me get over to other tables. So I can look at on this form not just uh, columns within the table that it's the primary table that it's bound to, but any table that I can relate to through my data model. Uh, so I have uh, the customer that placed this order, and I'll put their company name on there, uh, as well as maybe the uh, the order date, and uh, we'll go ahead and shrink this down a bit, and I'll make these fields a bit taller. Um, we can also set an anchoring property. I'm just doing some visual cleanup here. This will make them kind of equal sized and also um, draggable to resize. Um, so I will make that the first, well, it's already the first form in my solution. And what I'd like to do is show you in the browser as we build. So I'm going to launch the, um, the HTML5 client. And you can see that uh, right away we have uh, a grid that shows uh, the customer, which is in a different table than the order and also the, the order date. Okay. Um, the next thing I'd like to do is maybe make the detail side of this uh, same entity. So again, I'm going to right click in um, my solution explorer over here and create new form. It's based on the orders table again. We'll call this one um, maybe order detail. And um, we'll again, we'll use a bit of form inheritance here and we'll ex extend a form called detail base. And We'll pick the customer ID, the employee ID, um, maybe the ship city and ship country. Um, and place these on. Um, uh, it's made it a grid view. I'm going to switch this to a record view. Also, uh, I want to place those. I meant to place those uh, horizontally. So let's try that again. Customer, employee, ship city, ship country. That looks more like it. And we'll sort of lay these components out over here. Now, um, customer ID and employee ID are both foreign keys, but I can attach them to something called a value list, which um, 
brings in uh, information from other sources and allows me to um, to use like a type ahead uh, way of um, looking up the customer or the sales rep in this case. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, make that my my first form of my solution and show you in the browser. Uh, and I have to make one small tweak to my CSS here because I had that background color set to dark gray uh, for the whole page. Uh, but now you can see I've got it back to white. So uh, this is my order detail. Uh, you can see that I can change the customer uh, foreign key uh, using uh, a type ahead field. So I'm able to type in and, um, and actually move this uh, to a different customer. Same with the, uh, the sales rep. Um, so uh, let's um, sort of um, bring in some other components here on this form. Um, I have some third-party uh, libraries that I've included. Um, the Kendo pie chart, I'm going to add a reference to this uh, third-party library. I'm going to add a reference to my Google Maps uh, component and also um, uh, web notifications that will just be used to enhance the UI a bit. Uh, so I've created references to those packages so now I can use them in this application. Uh, and what I'd like to do is um, drop a map right here on, uh, on the form. You can see I should expand this a bit so it's easier to see. Um, there's my Google Map. It fits in underneath the web package for Google Maps. Um, now, Google changed the way they operate recently, so you have to plug in an API key. Um, I have that stashed away here in my notepad, so I'm going to copy and paste that back. Uh, and again, this is a data-bound component. It's really easy to use. All I have to do is hook it up to the uh, column calculation, etc., that I want from this entity, my orders table. And I've created a what's called a calculation here. Um, which will sort of format the address fields uh, so that in a way that Google likes to interpret them. So I'm going to save this uh, form here, um, bouncing back to um, uh, my uh, order detail screen. You can see that uh, it's now showing um, uh, the pin for uh, the location, that data binding here, and, and then it, it gives the map uh, around it. Um, it's data bound, so if I were to actually change um, change this and say move it to the city of uh, Lyon, uh, you can see that it, it, as soon as I change the data, the, the component responds to it. So uh, I didn't have to write any code yet. I'm not doing any tricks. It's, it's really just a drag drop and, and, and hook it up for data binding. Um, let's go, um, let's do the pie chart too. We saw that there was, um, there was a, a pie chart uh, showing the order. Um, the order details. I'll go ahead and um, and put that on there as well. That was under the Kendo UI library, and I'll drag this chart on there. Um, and so we have to set up a little bit of data binding for the chart as well. Um, you can see that uh, I can set the the found set to which it filters. Found set is a survey uh, expression which is um, really like a data set, like the return set of records. And one thing that's great is I can bind it to orders, but I can also bind it to something which relates from orders. So I have, um, I have the line items here uh, called order details. And then within there, I can set up the individual sort of the category, um, which I'll go to another table um, and grab the product name for the individual line item. The field that it's going to do the... Um, you know, the value, get the value from, which we'll use a calculated value on the item total, which is really quantity times unit price minus discount. And then the label itself is again going to be coming from the products table. So if I save this, I should be able to come back to my form. And while I don't have a pie chart, um, that's kind of cool, uh, but we'll put this into pie. And you, one thing you notice is that as I as I make changes and save them, I don't have to do anything, any sort of build or, or any other operations process 
I could just save it and, and right back in my preview client here in the browser, I can see everything broadcast uh, real time. Um, maybe we should make this add, form. Can I add to that, Sean? The, yeah, of course, please, Ken. While you're making changes to the app, the running application is updating. So, you know, you can uh, debug live. You can, you know, you're you're just you can add forms, everything, and you don't have to rerun the application. It's very dynamic. It's it's interesting because, like I said, that the source code is kind of treated like a server application. <laughs> so. Once you start using it, you realize it would, you know, it's it's a super powerful thing because uh, you, you can just, like I said, make changes. And what what you just, if he had those side by side, you'd be seeing the changes, and you know, there's no refreshing going on with the, you know, manually. It's just dynamic. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, maybe what we should do now is. Um is uh, sort of put these, you saw in the, the demo that I showed that, that they were side by side, the grid and, and the detail. So um, uh, perhaps we can um, put these side by side so we can see everything together. I'm going to create a third form. Um, again, we, based on orders, I'll call it orders main. Um, I'm going to extend. Um, wrong one. Another it's form using form out. inheritance. Yeah, the, it, yeah, it's the same as subclassing to extends. So you're yeah, and, and visually it, subclassing the form here. Yeah, and here here's maybe a better explanation of that because we can see something. Uh, so I've just included a search module that will allow me to uh, plug into an API for the searching as well as some reusable components here. Um, there's a container here uh, for the split uh, for the split panel, so all I have to do is drop in uh, using the place tab panel wizard. Um, uh, we're doing unrelated to orders and drop in my orders grid and orders detail. And again, I'm going to save that. And one more thing is to, I'll just make that the sort of the top level form. Um, that's called orders main. All right, and I might want to relaunch here to get that back up. All right, so um, so now we have a bit of um, uh, context here. Uh, we can see the order side by side. We also have a bit of CRUD control, so I get some buttons here which do some things like paging through um, uh, the results. Uh, I also get some some searching out of the box. So here's where I was able to type, you know, uh, Germany, and now I get uh, only those orders which uh, which show up in Germany. Um, if I want to maybe override that search a bit, uh, make it uh, a little bit uh, nicer, what I'm going to do is come into my orders main form and pick one of the uh, the APIs that I now have access to through inheritance and elect to override the method. Um, this is called get search providers. This gives the form the opportunity to return which, um, we call them data providers, but it's essentially which columns or related columns that um, you want to make searchable. Um, and this gets into a bit of the scripting side. Um, the return type you can see is uh, supposed to be an array of strings. And so uh, here's where I'm able to pull from my data model and, and make, um, say, orders to um, customers, uh, company name, and uh, we have uh, orders to employees. We got a bit of a lag going on here, I think, because of the go to meeting. Um, we'll do first name. Um, we also want to search on the last name. So this is uh, pretty powerful, even though it's uh, very simple uh, to do. And maybe we'll go two hops over to, we'll go order to order details, um, and order details to products, and product name. That's, what, that's how I was able to search for coffee, for example, which is in a table that is, that is two relations away from the primary table. Uh, these all have to be strings, by the way, uh, so I'll put them in quotes. Um, 
and of course you can use a double quote or a single quote, right? Yeah, JavaScript is is um, just like yeah, Fox Pro. Another thing I wanted to point out is the the semicolon after the line is optional. <laughs> Fox Wilbur's would be interested to know that. Yeah, you won't get in much trouble if you forget the semicolon, but I never forget it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so some people don't even want to look at them. Right, right. So I I don't want to show you a lot of code in this, but it's good to, for you to see that um, you know. Uh, what the, the developing experience is like. You can see that there's a lot of code complete. Um, the IDE knows a lot about my data model, uh, for example, so it's it's pretty easy to dive in and just and get oriented right away. And it's something that's important to add is that uh, Servoy has its own database engine and it's wrapping it around its own objects and you have pretty much all of the same functionality you'd have in Fox Pro. All that power in the XBase language against the data um, that you do with the XBase code, you do that through the wrapper objects that are in Servoy. All those, uh, you know, adding tables dynamically, um, you know, all kinds of filtering, searching, all that stuff is really powerful. It's very much like Fox Pro. It's just done in an object-based way. Hmm. Uh, so now, th now that I've I've added a few of those um, data providers to be searched, I can look, for example, in a in the company name. I type around, and you see, I get the company around the horn which is in another table or again I, I type chai which was a product if you recall um, nothing hit for that Let me, coffee uh, something's not quite right there I think I might have to relaunch for that one yeah, there we go. Um, although I haven't built the lower quadrant here of the screen um, for us to actually see that it contained that product, but I hope that makes it clear that now by just adding a few lines of code, I was able to extend my search to related tables, and it and there's really no limit on the depth of um, of the um, joins that you can search through on your data model. I didn't have to write any SQL. I barely had to write any JavaScript. Um, it's pretty powerful. Um, let's um, Let's uh, put this in um, in sort of a, a bit of a, a nicer frame and get in a little bit to CSS and a little bit to just some UI stuff. Um, I'm going to create another form. Oops. Uh, we'll call it demo main. Um, it doesn't really need a data source, so I'll set that to none. Um, we're going to extend something of another base form. Um, and we don't need any to place anything on the form. What I'm going to do is place in this tab panel. You notice that I'm placing forms within forms within forms. Um, that's sort of the way that you can um, reuse um, sort of that component architecture. Is just build a form and then you can reuse it in different places under different um, different contexts as well. Um, uh, we're going to go for our orders table, um, our orders main form. I mean. I get that in there. Um, also, there was a bit of CSS that I, I changed to get that uh, sort of centered dark look. Um, I don't mean to split those. I don't know why that happened. I dragged a bit. There we go. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the CSS because um, you know that's um, way into the details. But the point is, is that fully support uh, CSS3, which means you could do animations, all kinds of transitions, etc. Full control over the UI. Um, I think I should relaunch here as well. Um, oh, I need to set the the main form. The first form is now going to be demo main, so that when I launch the application, we get um, we get that sort of centered look with the the gray background. Um, I'm going to go into my order details form as well, um, and uh, I'm going to edit. Uh, why don't I give myself a bit more room here? And uh, what I'd like to do is maybe put a little header here and show you a bit of hooking up to some CSS and how easy it is. I'm going to uh, put some snapping on. Oh, it's on. Okay, I'm going to place a label here. Um, we'll make it nice and wide, and we'll also anchor it so that it grows to the right. Um, and now I'm going to place some text. I'm going to 
uh, uh, let me save this. Bring open the text editor. Um, now I can I can place text for my label but anywhere in Servoi you can show text. It can be data driven. It can be um, internationalized, meaning uh, multilingual, um, multi time zone, etc. Um, what I want to do is just show what the order number is and then um, who the customer is, just for brevity's sake. So uh, we'll put the order ID here and sort of inject it into my label. Basically, it's in Foxpro that would be text merge. But rather than having to use a function, it does it automatically on the fly. So all you do is use percent percent and anywhere, <laughs> and it will automatically uh, resolve that, just like text merge does. And, and uh, it's uh, it's yeah, it's anywhere you can show text, tooltips, labels, buttons, etc. Uh, one thing that I'll set is I'll set this display tags uh, property so that it knows to actually interpret those percent percent tags. I'm also going to add a um, uh, well, I'll make it opaque and I'll add a style class. Um, I had something here called uh, label header one. And the style and class comes from your CSS file, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, so now you can see I have that, that little sort of banner thing going across the top and you can see that it's also data driven. Uh, so it, it's showing the customer name. Um, maybe what I'd like to do is uh, copy that bring it down into the lower quadrant here, um, make a, uh, a small change to it, and I'm going to call this uh, order items, and I want to show the number of items. So there's some standard tags in there as well. I'll do orders to order details, pull one of these standard tags, which is the max record index, and I'll change the style class here to a slightly different uh, header style class and I'm preparing to put that that grid below but you can see now I, I have I'm showing the number of of items that are on uh, each order and um, finally uh, we want to build that grid um, we're running a little low on time so I'm going to go fast here and create a new form uh, we'll call this um, oh first we have to pick the order details data source. Um, maybe I'll name this uh, order items. Um, we'll extend that, that uh, grid base form again. And so here we want the um, product ID, quantity, discount, unit price, and I have a calculated item total price. Um, and we'll be placing those horizontal. That all looks good. Um, I have to make this a little bit wider and uh, make the fields a little taller and we'll give them the anchor uh, property so that they're resizable. Um, these came in as, uh, as not editable because one is a part of the primary key and the other one is a calculation, but we're going to make them editable. Um, I'm going to make all the fields transparent that lets that styling of the zebra stripes show through. Um, and let's have a look. So uh, if I go back to my orders main form, I'm oh, sorry, my orders detail form, um, I'm going to place a tab panel. And this time I'm going to actually select a relation. So I'm going to select orders to order details. And you see that my order items form shows up. I don't know why to. It made it so skinny, I think, because it went off the uh, off the page. I should give myself some more room here. Oh. There we go. Um, in any event, I'm going to drag this into location here. Um, I'll set this one to uh, to sort of anchor fool as well, and save. And now when I come back, I might want to. Relaunch here as well. There we go. Um, you'll see that I have the 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 grid down here, and it, it updates. So it's constraining the the records that are returned to be the context of the containing form, which is based on orders, and this one is based on order detail. So by leveraging that relation that I have between the two tables, again, I don't have to write any code. I don't have to write any SQL and it's bringing that stuff in for me. 
I don't have a product showing up here, but what I can do is quickly um, uh, hook this one up to my products value list. And now you can see that I'm actually able to select a product um, right out of my um, right out of my products value list and, and edit this and, and save it. And you can see that I got the save notification here uh, and I got my um, my uh, pie chart was updated. So um, all the stuff I showed in the demo is already available uh, right here. Uh, I just had to sort of lay it out and hook up the data binding. Uh, I think that, that pretty much concludes everything that I set out to show you guys. Um, uh, okay. I hope that you found it. Thanks, uh, uh, um, yeah, we have a few minutes left for questions, so feel free. There's a couple coming in already that I will I will take as they come in, and feel free if you have any last minute questions to post them right now to the questions channel. We'll try to uh, to hang on a little bit here with uh, with the questions that are popping in. While those questions, while you guys are typing your questions, I have one two in the slide that I want to uh, to show you. So feel free to start posting those uh, those questions. And um, let's go in here and go here and make this a bit bigger. Right, so to conclude um, this, this session, uh, there are four ways uh, we think after this session for you to, to test the waters out. First of all, we provide you with a scripted demo, which is a free one hour demo that we can give to you one on one based on your application, based on your situation and, and the input that you provide uh, to us. The second uh, step typically is if you need a bit more time is we do a proof of concept together with you, which usually takes between two and five days to make or build like a small application on your Fox Pro application or integrate with it or you know whatever you want uh, to do. Uh, another step can be to build a pilot, so which is building a, a real application that you can show to your to your customers uh, potentially. And typically, if you would then move forward, we enter into what we call the Appurance program, and this is the program where we train your development team, where we help you to get started, where we we get you up to speed with the Servoy frameworks and the best practices, and get you fully trained to build commercial quality applications. So if you have any questions uh, about Servoy and or pricing, you can contact um, um, you can contact me directly, uh, either through the phone numbers on our website on servoy.com slash contact, or by email if that's what you want to do. My email and Sean's email are listed here. If you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with Ken, uh, then you can send him an email as well, or maybe you want to work together with uh, uh, Ken. He has experience in, in Servoy, and as you probably know, a lot of experience in Fox Pro. So feel free to, uh, to do that.